Welcome to Learning with Lisa, Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast with Lisa Navarra, award-winning educator, consultant, behavior specialist, author, and parent. Welcome to Student Success Beyond Expectations. I'm talking to all of you parents out there, and I want to hit your heart with this. Have you ever thought to yourself, my child has so much potential, or their loved ones and other people in their lives are saying, wow, if only she could do this, then things would be so much easier. And isn't it heartbreaking when you just see that they're trying to do what it is that they want to accomplish, but they just simply don't have those skills? Well, Dr. Noreen Russell is here with us today, and she's a mom. She's a professional. She is inspired, and she's here, yes. She's going to give us tips for the unmotivated teen and disorganized kids, which of course is really going to be concrete. It's going to be great and helpful. But I really, as if you're an avid listener, you know I want to get to the heart of why people do the things that they do. And Dr. Russell is building an empire as she affects the change and growth within children through the grades of elementary, through college. You see her and Russell coaching for students is really taking, you're gonna love this because if you follow me, you know this is what I'm all about, but she takes the social emotional learning skills and executive functioning skills and she's able to support children's growth in those areas as needed. But here's a really special part. Again, if you're that parent saying, if only my child could, See, her company and her, she works with children who have more than one diagnosis. You know those comorbidities? Well, this is the special part. So much where the mainstream public still, and I I understand this as being a practitioner, like they just don't get it. But if you're that parent who's saying, where do I go? This is why she's getting referrals and really doesn't even advertise, let's say, going to conferences and trying to get the word out there because now we're looking at a whole paradigm shift, which, okay, that is my direction. That that tends to be my approach too. But you know what? It's all about referrals. She's got schools calling her. She's got community-based organizations calling her. She's got other parents referring to other parents calling her. And we are now going to speak with Dr. Maureen Russell so she could tell us where she's come from, her why, and how what she knows can help all of you. Welcome. I am delighted to be here. And that is the most lovely introduction I have ever received. Thank you. You deserve it. Thank you. So tell us your journey. You had children. What inspired you? Tell us a little bit about your background of um, your academia, and then just bring us right into here and now. Sure. I think I'm someone who has always been all about personal growth and personal well-being and happiness and the positive side of psychology. So I have my PhD in psychology with a focus on developmental psychology and kind of all the positive side of psychology and have really done a few different things since graduate school. So first I was an academic, which was great, loved it, loved working directly with college students and teaching. Then I ran a couple different nonprofits, which I also loved because you talk about a paradigm shift, right? If you can successfully work in a community with schools, community-based organizations, parents, and youth, you know, you can really start to make a difference. And then I had my son and became a mom and he's pretty complex. And so I retired from nonprofit work and really through the request of of the community here in Tampa Bay, where I live, um, started a student coaching practice. And now it's 14 years later, and we do academic ADHD and life coaching for students. And I absolutely love it. So explain to our listeners, what do you mean by life coaching? Sure. Absolutely. So this is an important question you've asked. So at our practice, we specialize in academic ADHD and life coaching. So what that means is we will work with students anywhere from elementary school through college age 
who are, you know, that phrase that I don't, I don't love it, but, but it's useful, not living up to their potential mm. or they have roadblocks that are getting in their way. And, um, they're trying to move forward in their life and they have goals, but something's holding them back. Right. And so we work with kids who are neurologically complex. They have for the most part, more than one diagnosis. So they might have ADHD and autism. They might have ADHD and anxiety. They might have dyslexia and anxiety. And we help them with those very concrete skills of, okay, ninth grade is overwhelming me and I feel miserable and my parents are losing patience with me and I'm not getting my homework turned in and I'm not passing my tests. Okay, so let's all breathe. That's right. what happens when you yes. do muscle code. Let's take a breath, right? Let's step back a little bit. Let's do some assessment of what your skills are, executive functioning, learning and study skills, social and emotional skills. Let's figure out where your strengths are and also what are the roadblocks, right? Is it prioritizing? Is it planning? Is it logging onto the portal and figuring out what do you do tonight versus what do you do tomorrow? Is it time management? You know, um, is it coping with the stress that our young people feel these days? And in coaching, we work very specifically on whatever those skills are that the student feels like will help them get to their goals. So they set goals for the semester. They set goals for the week. They work on, you know, task initiation, task completion, you know, um, so I, I want to stop you there, Dr. Russell, yeah. because, you know, a lot of people can say, well, it just sounds like the kid's lazy and not organized. So really, right. So I just want to stop you because I want to remind our listeners that what we're talking about and all the, those things that Dr. Russell has just um, like planning and organizing. We just want to reiterate that that's the executive functioning skills. So what she's doing is really assessing what skills in their brain is un, maybe delayed, right? And they need to build. So she, her company is specifically building those areas. So then your child can perform certain tasks. Okay. So I just wanted to stop you there and make that connection. So please continue. No, absolutely. You're so right. These are the kids who get described as lazy or unmotivated. These are the kids who get the comments on report cards. You know, if he only tried harder only, and it's not right. Right. And it's not a question of that. I don't know about you, but I don't wake up any morning and think, Oh, I'm going to be unmotivated today. Right. <laughs> yeah. When I don't get things done, it's because I feel overwhelmed. I'm depressed. I physically don't feel well. We need to go deeper into what looks like and often gets labeled as laziness or a lack of motivation and really understand what's going on and and understand you know as Ross Green says if they could they would and I think that's equally true for adults and children and, and you know what when you say to really understand what's going on I always think that the teacher preparation courses and programs don't prepare educators for this. And mm -hmm. so I, I humbly speak that we need to remember that, that there's so much more going on that we haven't been trained in. So although we're well-intended and we mean well, we are sometimes missing the mark and we're taking quote unquote symptoms. I've got the air quotes if you're listening and you're not watching us on YouTube and we're, we are now encountering symptoms of deficits in executive functioning, maybe in those diagnoses and or social emotional learning skills. So the same thing goes for parenting, right? So we are stuck with the symptoms. He just doesn't listen. He knows what to do. She can tell me what she was supposed to do. And then the same mistake happens again, right? So it's not always just defiance. It's not always just not being uncooperative. So if yeah. your child does have one or more diagnoses, what Dr. Russell is saying to you here could be very, very meaningful. So thank you. So really understanding what it is that we're looking at is what you and your company does. Yep, yep. And then a very practical, hands-on way of 
How do we make an improvement? You know, that's what I love about coaching. It's action oriented. It's solving yes. problems. It's achieving goals. I love it. Hence coaching. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all right. So talk to us about unmotivated teens for those parents out there or those teachers out there, service providers who need some tips. What do you have for us? Okay, so let's just quickly revisit the point you made a minute ago because it's so vitally important, right? We have to understand the why of what looks like a lack of motivation. To be honest, it's not a lack of motivation. It's something else, right? It's a feeling of being overwhelmed. It's stress. It's an inability to cope. It's, you know, a physical concern where, you know, something's not right in their body. It is a psychological problem like stress or anxiety, but there are really very few teenagers who are genuinely not motivated to do anything. Even the kid who lays around in bed all day or the kid who games all day, that's what they're motivated to do. Right. And so we have to really approach it from not labeling behavior but understanding the self and understanding, is this a symptom of something else? And once we do that, I think fundamentally it shifts the paradigm, right? Whether you're an educator or a parent, when you move from trying to control the behavior to empathizing with the behavior and coaching different behavior, it's just a 180 degree change. So that's what has to happen first is for us to become curious about what's going on and figure out why does this high schooler or college student look unmotivated. So to dig deeper too, what you're saying is now we're becoming supportive with that understanding. Now we become more supportive. And you know what that does for us as individuals? It makes us feel better and less frustrated. And the less frustrated we feel and the more accomplished and effective we feel, no matter whether we're with a parent and or educator, then we're more likely to engage in the same, the behaviors that that child needs us to engage in. So it all starts with understanding. If you don't understand, you need to call Dr. Russell. And if you don't understand, then that's where you start your self-help books, you know, and you start Googling and, and, and you connect with the things that make sense. And sometimes you have to start from the inside out instead or the outside in to really understand what's going on from the inside. So being supportive. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I have five specific tips for your listeners. If, okay. if, if you think they would. Um, so the first one is, I think it's really important building on that empathy to share your own stories of when you have felt stuck or unmotivated, right? Because we have all been there. We have all been there. When I was trying to finish my dissertation, when I was looking for a job, when I have tried to build certain aspects of my coaching business, we've all felt stuck or stressed. And so let's talk to, you know, our eight-year-old or 18-year-old and say, you know, I've been there too. I've been there too. Yesterday at work, I got a really big project and I felt super stressed out and I had to go down and get a Starbucks and take a break and go for a walk. So tip number one is share your own story of when you have been in a similar situation. This normalizes it. And again, it helps you to stay connected to the empathy. Second thing I'll say is that I think it's so important for us to remember that in kids with ADHD, the reward system is not very easily activated. And so we have got to look to what is rewarding and how can we create a reward system or provide external rewards to help our kids with ADHD, whether they're in elementary school or middle school or even high school, when we think, well, they should be beyond needing a reward for what's just the right behavior. But this assumes that their brain is giving them that internal reward and it's not. So tip number two is really, really hit the rewards, reinforcement, praise, respect, heavy, 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 and consistently with your child or teenager with ADHD. Does that make sense? It makes a tremendous amount of sense. So we should not be hearing 
well, I don't think that he should be having a checklist because I'm preparing him for high school next year. I'm preparing him from sixth grade middle school. It drives me crazy. I'm like, let me go talk to them. <laughs> because yeah. we're not for developing those underdeveloped needs. Is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, that leads directly into tip three. Meet your child where they're at. If they're terrible at organization or they're terrible at time management, you know, let's work on one thing at a time. Let's not complain about it. And let's, you know, Google how to teach kids organization, how to teach kids time management. And let's set manageable goals, right? We wouldn't like it if our boss came in and said, okay, I'd like to get a report from you in six months of how you've increased productivity 150%. I mean, I don't know about you, but my blood pressure goes up just listening to that, right? Yeah. You know, I'd like you to learn how to tell, you know, when it's 10 minutes before we have to leave and get your shoes. That feels a little bit more manageable, right? Yes. And so tip number three is meet your child where they're at and help with one specific skill at a time. Okay. Got it. Fourth, I think if you have an unmotivated child or an unmotivated teenager, we do have to look at the role of electronics and social media. And if they are getting everything that they need for their brain and their body to be healthy, right? And so, you know, exercise, diet and nutrition, um, you know, a good supportive routine, you know, we have to look at how everything, including electronics and social media is affecting, you know, kids or teens, no matter what their age are, because we know research is clear that too much time spent gaming, too much time spent on social media is not good for our mental health. And so it becomes very easy to check out of oh, well, I don't want to prepare for, you know, my middle school math test, or I don't want to, you know, work on my term paper for eighth grade. If you can sort of distract yourself with, you know, Instagram and TikTok. And, and so I know we all know that, but I think it's important for us as parents to really pay attention to how is your child using their electronics? Is it for coping or is it for connection? Right, right. Really yeah. great points. Yeah. And then tip number five on the unmotivated um, teens is it is perfectly reasonable to work within what I call a paycheck system, right? So there are a lot of, you know, teens who sort of take it for granted. I'm going to have access to a phone. I'm going to have access to unlimited internet. I'm going to have access to spending money, right? Well, we know as adults, we don't have those things unless we earn them. And so figuring out a effective paycheck system for your teenager where they have to earn their paycheck, they have to earn the privileges. We're not talking about going back to a punishment where you're going to take their phone away if they don't do well, but we're saying we expect you to, you know, have less than 10% of missing assignments and we expect you to maintain B's and C's if that's, you know, what your child is capable of. And if each week you do that, then yes, you will have privileges for the following week. It's not about punishment. It's about competency and accountability and relationships. And so tip five is don't be afraid to think of these goals and skills that, that you're wishing that your unmotivated teen would do and think of them as analogous to your work, right? We don't get paid unless we work. Well, right. Very, same very well said. Be true, you know, and, and we're better at that in the elementary school years. And then somehow it's like, it's well, like, I don't know. You know, we, we get a little looser in middle school and we get a little looser in high school, but it's not a good message for children or teenagers to have everything they want without having to also do the other side of it, which is the hard work and their work at this time is school. Right, especially if they have executive functioning delays, cognitive delays, 
I was just saying that I had read an article, which I think is very interesting. Uh, and it had that, and it, basically it said, we all have a blueprint for these executive functioning skills, but we don't mm -hmm. necessarily have executive functioning skills. We have to build them. And that means just like we do with walking and talking, these skills that, that Dr. Russell is supporting have to be built where sometimes we're setting those expectations as if they already have these skills. And so these top five suggestions and tips are really very helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think it's important for us to remind ourselves that it's not about knowing, right? It's about doing. And, and some analogies for us as adults are, we all know we should eat right. We all know we should get exercise. We all know we should be maxing out our retirement accounts. We all know we should be treating our loved ones, you know, better than we treat strangers on the street. But do we always do that? We don't. And so let's be real with ourselves and say, yeah, our teenagers and our children also probably know, oh, not a good idea to spend three hours on TikTok, talk, excuse me, TikTok when I have homework to do, but sometimes it's hard to get started on things or we feel, as you said, unmotivated. And so, you know, I think when it comes to the motivation piece, it's not about being told what to do. What we strive to do in coaching is help children and teens practice that so that it just becomes a normal part of their life, you know, and it is practice over and over again. It's like going to the gym, going to the gym for your body and working out mentally are the same thing. And it takes time and practice. That's what I was going to ask you. I, I was just speaking with a, a someone who had called me for potential services for her and her two twins. And she asked me that, that, that question, which is how many sessions does it usually take? I knew she was going to go there. So what do you say to, to those parents? Or those educators who say, you know, how, how many do you think it's going to take? Oh. Well, what we've learned over the last 14 years of being in practice is that our method, Connected Coaching, takes on average about a semester. You have to do an assessment of the skills, you have to set goals, and then you have to work on those skills that are deficient one skill at a time. And when you add the second one and the third one, you have to make sure you're still keeping up with the first one, right? So let's say our three skills deficits are time management, task initiation, and task completion. Mm -hmm. Well, we can start with any of those and build, but that is a lot of new work. That is a lot of behavior change. And, you know, we've learned that a semester is really about the time it takes for kids to benefit from our method. We also see kids with ADHD for longer than that, because when you think about the fact that many, many students with ADHD at whatever age they are, are delayed three years or 30%, right. that student can be out of sync with school expectations all the way up through their mid twenties. And so some students with ADHD are going to need help with self-regulation and executive functioning skills for a while, because as the expectations keep growing, those skills don't always keep up. Right, right. This is such valuable information, and I really hope our listeners are getting this. If not, put it on rewind because it's worth hearing again. So what do you have for us for, dis for disorganized kids? Okay, disorganized kids. Also, five tips. Um, first, and this is always the case, right? Take a look at what you're doing. Take a look at if your child is overscheduled. Do they have too much stuff in their room? Are there too many expectations, right? We need to, as step one, simplify our lives to the point where it's not overwhelming our children or teens and they're having meltdowns or they're sleeping too much or they're having anxiety. So tip one is the same as with unmotivated teens. Take a look at your own self and see what can you change about the way your household runs. Um, so that's the most important. Second, I think, is make visual reminders. When I'm coaching parents, my very first thing that I ask them to do is order a box of sheet protectors. 
And you are going to put those visual reminders in the sheet protectors, and you're going to hang them in the mudroom, in the landing pad, in the bathroom, in the bedroom. You know why? Because you don't want to be using verbal reminders all the time and getting engaged in long discussions with your seven-year-old or your 12-year-old or your 17-year-old about why they should put their shoes in their closet, right? I mean, you just don't. And so the visual reminder piece when they're younger helps them to internalize why that's important. And when they're older, it helps them to be um, independent. And so, and I really have found with my own kids that starting in elementary school, they can make their own reminders. I would say, hey, can yes. you make a reminder about that? Like, and they would jump on the computer, make a reminder, stick it in the sheet protector in our mudroom and, you know, be good. And they would far rather have that than have me saying, do you have your shoes? Do you have your shoes? Do you have your <laughs> shoes today? You know, no, I mean, nobody likes that. Right. And yes. so visual cues, you know, and if it's a series of steps for homework, like come home, eat, snack, drink water, empty backpack get out homework, work on homework for 20 minutes, take right. a five minute break and set right. a timer for right. five minutes, right? It's perfectly okay to put all those things on a list. I mean, how many of us had to go through that when we were teaching our kids to shower or bathe independently, right? Make sure you wash your hair, make sure you wash your body, make That's sure right. you scrub your nails, you know? The same thing is true with so many of these executive functioning skills. So visual aids. Um, third is, I think a weekly cleanup around the house is essential. So, you know, if you're feeling like your kid is super disorganized or your house is driving you crazy, you know, then every Friday afternoon before the weekend starts, okay, let's all go through and put five things away. You know, let's all go through the house and spend 10 minutes putting things back where they belong, but having some kind of routine or structure to that is I think vitally important and teaches good habits and makes us all feel better. Who doesn't like it when things are neat and tidy around the house and we're not tripping over Legos? I love it. Hi, uh, exactly. No oh, clothes and socks. Socks. Oh, here socks. Right. I don't stand the socks. Yeah. Oh, the socks. Yeah. <laughs> well, and at my house, the cats love the socks, and so if the socks get out of the drawer, then they end up all over the house. So, all right. Yeah. Absolutely. We need a weekly cleanup. Okay. Tip number four is. Get a big calendar. Yes, we all have our phones. I love my phone. I use a calendar app. You know, my kids have Google calendars. I get that. But I think that every family also needs a wall calendar. Call me old fashioned, but that's tip number four. And I think not only do you need a wall calendar, but you need to have a set time when you take a look at that wall calendar and you fill it in. So is that Monday night after the first, you know, day of the, work week, school week. Okay. I'm going to bring the calendar to dinner. We're going to fill in what's going on this week. Mm -hmm. You know, is it Sunday, you know, Sunday at brunch time. Okay. Let's everybody put on the calendar what's going on. I think it's important because while technology does help us collaborate, a lot of times we get lost in what is our own schedule and we don't understand the bigger picture. And then it's easy for kids to get disorganized, right? They don't know that they have, you know, practice for the new dance team three nights a week. They don't necessarily know that mom and dad are going away for the weekend this weekend. And so it's easy to get disorganized because they don't know what to expect. And so the wall calendar, I think, is essential. And, you know, everyone can contribute to the wall calendar. Just get one with big squares. I love the fact that you said, take it off the wall, bring it to the table and work on it as a family. I, I love yeah. that. I, I don't yeah. know how many people are actually doing that. And if you're hearing us and you are, or you're not, you like that idea or you have any comments about anything, be sure to add comments because these are really great, helpful tips. And the more that you engage too with us, the more you can help one another too with what works and what you've tried and, and whatnot. So I love that you have it as a collaborative strategy and a collaborative tip. Thank you. And have people send in pictures of their monthly okay. calendar, you know, like yes. I've got on there, you know, tickets to this gone this day, you know, and, and, you know, for our ADHD kids who can be time blind, it's very easy to start being disorganized. And so I just, 
yeah, bring it to the table, put it on the dining room table, dish up dinner or brunch and, and fill it out. Okay, fifth, fifth tip is keep donation bins around the house. How many of us have stuff in our house that, you know, the kids no longer play with, they no longer want, they've outgrown that toy. They have 10,000 stuffed animals. I know some of your listeners have these kids, right? Keep a donation box in each kid's room, label it donation box and encourage them to use it. Or when you're doing your weekly cleanup, say, can that go in the donation bin, right? Get in the habit of not just putting stuff away, but giving stuff away so that we keep our lives simple and uncluttered. And I think having a donation box, and if you're one of those people for whom this really matters, get a cute little wicker basket, right? Oh, right. Get a colorful bin. Yeah. You know, you don't have to use, you know, your cardboard box from Amazon. I mean, that's what I use, but, you know, get something cute that matches the decor, but make sure that you're in the habit of saying, is this something we still need? Um, because some of our kids with ADHD, right? They don't stop and think about that. They're just shoving the stuff in the drawer under the bed. Oh yeah. We want to teach them to pause and say, am I still using this? Do I need this? Do these shoes still fit? And so when we have less to organize, we can be more organized. That makes sense. Absolutely. It makes sense. And, and the more organized things are, the less overwhelmed they feel, less overwhelmed they feel, the more likely they are to step back, take that breath and be able to say, this is what I need to do. And I can do it. I can start as we say launch and begin that task without shutting down. So it absolutely makes a tremendous amount of sense. These are all great tips. And when you think about whatever you do, when it comes to motivation or organization, think about it from a systems point of view, right? You don't want to be the one motivating your teenager. You don't want to be the one organizing your child. So how can you put things into place that teach them those skills and teach them how to self-regulate, right? What would motivate you to get started on doing, you know, your Quizlet for your IB test, right? What would help, you know, that helps your teenager develop the metacognition of how do I problem solve rather than, okay, let's get started. Let's get started. Did you start yet? Did you start yet? I mean, nobody thrives like that. So help by setting up systems. Same thing with organization. Don't be the one who organizes everything. Teach your kids how to organize. And then, of course, we have to be patient, you know, and we have to expect 75, 80%, not 100%. Right. So explain to our listeners today about how having an external motivator for the right reason is not bribery, but it's really what internally that they need. Explain that to our listeners. Sure, sure. And, you know, you and I don't have to get into the in-depth neurology of that. But what I think is important for your listeners to understand is that, yes, of course, as parents and, and even as professionals, we want kids and teens to be self-motivated. But the neural pathways between the motivation center of the brain and the frontal lobe, which makes the decisions and does planning and prioritizing, is just not as fast or as efficient in people with ADHD. And so when we say that, it's really coming from a neurotypical point of view. Like, well, we shouldn't have to bribe them. We shouldn't have to reward them. I want them to be internally rewarded. Well, you know what? They want that too, but their brain isn't wired like that yes, yet. That what too. I think is so important is when we combine that with what we know about the pruning of the brain during adolescence, we want to be building that super highway between motivation and the frontal lobe. And if that means providing the external rewards, we have to stop thinking, well, then they're only going to do things when they get rewarded, right? We have to think of it as building the brain connection between I did this, it feels good. And, you know, I feel pride in that. And I got a reward. And, you know, yes, I'm yes. Say this again. Well, you we just said real. building the brain connection, but you, this is what you just did, Dr. Russell. You just took 
what we started with and you just applied it to an example. And we started with what? Executive functioning skills, student academics, and social emotional learning. So if you heard Dr. Russell just say that, wow, you know what? I got it done and I feel good. That is the insider tip right there. Once your child feels feels good about something. And if you're recognizing the fact that they don't recognize it, that's when you stop them and say, how do you feel? What did you do? So they can start to internalize what we, if we are typical, and this is an easier skill for us, what we would normally just be like, oh, I felt good. I'm going to do that again. They need that explicit teaching of what just happened. And that's exactly what you just said, Dr. Russell, building the brain connection and putting that social emotional learning in with it all. Thank you. for And that. then go celebrate with ice cream. Ah, yay. <laughs> Fantastic. Dr. Russell, where do our listeners find you? Sure. Um, easy question. And I'm glad you asked. So our website for the practice is russellcoaching.com. And Russell has two S's and two L's. Everyone always asks me that. You can also just type my name into your Google search bar, Noreen Russell and Russell Coaching will come up. And from there, you'll see the links to all of our social media and LinkedIn. We do have a blog on the website as well as um, probably 30 or 40 podcasts that I've appeared as an expert guest on. And so we're really big on trying to provide resources because we know how hard it is to raise kids with ADHD. It's one of the most frustrating experiences as a parent. And knowing that your child knows but can't do is so frustrating as a parent. So we're at russellcoaching.com and um, you'll see that the email is just info at russellcoaching.com or you can call the office at 212-716-1161. And we'll have all this information and the links in the description for you too. So that way you could just click away, call away and whatnot. So I have to really thank you because today's discussion was really a wealth of information. I think we really broke it down to um, areas that people can apply. Your five tips in those two different areas are super helpful, but really what was helpful to was you sharing what was your connection and what was your experience that you shared with us in the beginning of our discussion here? Because parents aren't alone and neither are kids. And we need to always remember if we are experiencing something, somebody else is, and there's going to be a great effective resource and inspiration out there to help us along the way. So thank you for spending your time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. And that is just right. The most lovely thought. We aren't alone. Look for the connection. You will find the support. Thank you for having me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to perhaps support some of your listeners. Absolutely our pleasure. And if you're listening, be sure to like and share this episode with your friends in your own network. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast, where school leaders, educators, and parents meet on behalf of children who struggle with learning.